God is going to release wisdom to you today. Your eyes are going to open up in the spiritual realm. I want to share the difference between walking as a disciple and as a Pharisee. The differences that we see in the Word of God. The spirit of the Pharisee is still alive today. And many people read the Bible, reading such stories as more like history. Or maybe when you read the Bible, you just look at the, 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 the directions of how to behave. But you miss the revelation that is hidden in the stories when Jesus is walking on the earth. When Jesus came on the scene, he came in this brand new way, teaching a new way. There were so, so many things different about him than what the people of God, which were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, way different than what the people of God knew at that time. It was completely different. And Jesus, the, the disciples whom he chose, they weren't Pharisees. They weren't Sadducees. There's a reason for that. There's a reason he was intentional to choose who he chose. The ones he chose were humble. They were like a child. They could receive Jesus. They didn't have judgment or criticism or skepticism inside of them. They were a blank canvas. Now, you don't have to be a day one believer who knows nothing about God to be chosen by God and to be used by God and to receive him. You need to adopt this blank canvas, emptying out humility of as much as I have learned, as many things that I know to be true about God. I'm ready for him to confound me at any moment if he wants to. If there has been false doctrine that's come in me in some way, if there's been false prophets or false teachers who taught me things that weren't of God, if there has been people who had good intentions but eyes weren't opened and I received what they had for me, I am open to that possibility. I humble myself and I say, God, have your way with me. That's humility. That's humility. That is humility right there. No matter how much you've learned, no matter what kind of ranking you have in a church as a leader, no matter how much status or fame you have as a Christian leader, you remain just as humble as when you're a day one believer. In fact, it should be more, as the responsibility is so much more, the more responsibility that you are given, the more you're entrusted with. You can be confident in what God speaks to you, in what God reveals to you, but still be just as humble. God uses other people to reveal things. The, 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 the ways I've received revelations from God and heard things deep in the spiritual realm, most of the time it has actually come through another vessel of God. But God in his goodness, when you have an open, humble heart, and you recognize this is the way in which God moves as he chooses many times to use other people. When you can have that humble, open heart and, and, and you receive truth from a true vessel of God, a true prophet, a true teacher, a true mouthpiece of God. When you have that humble, childlike heart, God, the Holy Spirit will, will reveal to you, this is Jesus. This is truth. There were many things in my life that I learned. I, you know, I've been a Christian since day one, since I, I have no memories of not knowing God and not loving Him. 
was four years old when I gave my life to Jesus. Part one of giving my life, and then there's deeper steps of surrender the more you meet Jesus. But, I mean, I, I attended church every single, like probably 99% of the Sundays in my life, of my life. You know, there's so much Christian knowledge I had received. But one day, God opened up my eyes to many things. Number one, that he still moves in power today. That miracles happen today. That he, that he casts out demons today. That he heals the sick today. That he speaks prophetically through people. That he can raise the dead. I had no clue these things were existed. Speaking in tongues, that people even did that, that I could receive that gift. I had no clue. I had not learned that at all. And then one day, God opened my eyes up. You thought, you thought I was only here? Catherine, look. This is the real me. This is really me. This is much deeper me than you've ever known. And when God had prepared me to be like a child in that place where I opened up, where he opened up my eyes, he had prepared me. So, so because I had been prepared to not think I know it all just because I've been a Christian my whole life, <laughs> because I had been prepared when God opened my eyes, I knew it was him more than I knew anything in my life. Because he had prepared my heart, because I had emptied myself out, become like a child, no one could take what I knew. I mean, I knew it more than I knew anything in my life. God had revealed, this is really me. Even though what I had received was such a minority compared to all of the teachings that I received, compared to all of the hundreds, thousands of Christian people in my life whom I'd known. None of them had testified that they witnessed or encountered God moving in that way. Yet none of that mattered. It didn't matter if a million people testified to me what I had just heard, what I had just seen, what I had just received, or if it was just me and the Holy Spirit in me convicting me. It didn't matter. I knew this is truth. This is Jesus. And that humbled me greatly. That is when I started learning the real meaning of you cannot be like, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become like a child. You cannot hear God's voice unless you become like a child. You'll hear the Pharisees' lies, you'll hear religious lies, but you won't hear God's voice unless you become like a child. God taught me that because I knew how I came into that place, that, that, that little small house church where God opened up, all my, opened up my eyes. God taught me through that experience. He taught me. He said, see, you didn't come in judging and skeptical. You came in like a child. You came in hungry for me and open. And so then I could reveal to you more than anybody else that you know in your life has. And I had the fruits of it. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, began speaking in tongues. I became on fire for Jesus, something I had longed for but never attained until that moment to be on fire for him, to surrender. And I could see the difference in my life, myself, like the fire, the real fire I felt I had compared to other lukewarm believers around me. I could see the fruit. So God taught me so much from that. I, I was so humbled, like, see, Catherine, the only reason that, that you, your eyes got to be open like this. I mean, this is, this is a gift. This is precious. The only reason is because you became like a child and you emptied yourself out. You came in there not with all your 24 years of Christian knowledge, but you just came in empty ready to be 
confounded. So in that moment, when God opened up my eyes, there's so much that I had learned, 20 something years of being a Christian that I had to empty out, that I had to throw away. Not everything, not everything, no, but like most things, like a lot of things, because a lot of things were religious. A lot of things were void of the revelation that God moves in power. But the Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Ah, so if you really don't believe God moves in power and miracles, you don't welcome his spirit, you don't welcome that, then that's not the kingdom of God at all. There's so, there's so much I had to just empty out. I had to just throw it away. It humbled me so much to know I, I, I became more humble the more God opened my eyes. Because he taught me. You should be confident in what God calls you to do, but, but, but don't, don't become spiritually prideful or arrogant. Be ready. Have the heart ready any day to be corrected, to be confounded. Hallelujah. So there's so much we can learn from the disciples. The Pharisees, they thought they knew it all. And so Jesus starts doing things against what they knew to be true about God, against their religious rules. Their God was, you need to follow these rules. And if you don't, you're being a bad person of God. And so the Pharisees, They, they came with a spirit of pride, a spirit of arrogance, and also a spirit of loving power. And when you come with that spirit, those things are the opposite of humility. Those are the things that the opposite of being like a child. And so when they looked at Jesus, they, they could not see God in him at all because those spirits blocked them, because those spirits are opposite of being like a child. So they came and they saw Jesus and his disciples are eating on, on the Sabbath, harvesting grain. They say, your disciples shouldn't be harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus, Jesus ends up uh, sharing with them his new way. He's teaching them. He's trying to teach them, listen, I'm coming with a new way. This is the religion way. I'm teaching you, a, this, is, this is God. This is me. This is Jesus. And he says, he ends up saying, if only you could learn the meaning of the words, I want compassion more than a sacrifice. You wouldn't be condemning my innocent disciples. So he's saying to these, these Pharisees, if only you could have love and compassion, put that on instead of judgment, condemnation, skepticism, pride. If only then you, you wouldn't even see that they were doing something wrong. You would see God in them. So he's, he's warning, this is a warning to us right now, that if you accept that spirit of pride and thinking you know it all when it comes to Christianity and what God's doing, then you'll end up condemning and judging where God actually is. God was actually in the disciples at that moment. Yet the, disciple, yet the Pharisees are saying the opposite. They begin demonizing the disciples. They begin demonizing Jesus. Next, we see 
Jesus healing somebody on the Sabbath. And this goes against the law, the, the, the Jewish law. And the Bible says that they were looking now for Jesus, to catch Jesus going against the law. So all of a sudden now we have the Pharisees demonizing somebody who's the, as innocent as could be, and they were in the wrong. So this all came from that spirit of religious pride. When, that, when the spirit of religious pride is there, then your eyes are blinded to see where God is actually moving. You forget the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. We're called to put on love to never judge. Judge or you will be judged. We are never called to judge. Even if we could be right about, you know, someone's doing something wrong, we're still not called to judge. Now here we see they were completely in the wrong, yet they themselves were so sure they were in the right. Having that spirit of pride allowed the devil to play God in their ear and say, devils in Jesus, devils in the disciples, take them down. That, was what, that is what was going on in the spiritual realm. So now all of a sudden they're, because of that spirit, they're hearing the devil, but they think it's God because they are full of religious pride. Now, now devil comes as an angel of light, it says. So here, this is what's going on. So now they're saying, ah, this guy, he's going very against God. We need to, we need to catch him doing more wrong things. We need to take him down. Now that's all that they can see, all that they can see. Now they've made it their mission to get this guy removed. Jesus was healing somebody on the Sabbath. Now, if you, if you come as a bystander to this situation, you can be a Christian or a non-Christian. You could be a disciple of Jesus at the time, or you could be a, not knowing that God exists at all. And you see some... You see this guy, Jesus, named Jesus, healing somebody who you've seen is suffering. You know they're sick. And Jesus heals their hand, their broken hand, that's causing them all sorts of pain. And you see the reaction on the guy's face. You see the guy jumping up and down. You see the joy. At the same time, you see the greatest act of love, example of love you've ever seen through Jesus. You can see the love glowing from his face. You can see the pure intentions glowing from Jesus. The way that Jesus responds to the whole situation, you can see how humble he is. I'm just wanting you to put yourself in the, like imagine Jesus healing the guy's hand. Imagine that, how that was looking, okay? So you can be a disciple of Jesus and you're gonna be amazed. You're gonna be like, wow, we are so blessed to be a disciple of Jesus. That, God has chosen us for this. This is God. I am convinced. Nobody can tell me otherwise. This is absolutely God. This is the greatest love I've ever seen. And then you can also be an, a bystander who knows nothing about God. And you would watch this and you would see, uh, you know, the, the reaction of the guy, the, how it was undeniable that it was a miracle. And you see the love glowing from Jesus. I mean, his facial reactions, the way he speaks, um, the way he's not like gloating or boasting, but giving glory to God. Like as a bystander who doesn't know anything about God, you can see this situation and you can, it'll be pretty impossible to not find Jesus in that moment, to not find God in that moment. You can see there's nothing but pure love. There's nothing fishy. There's nothing demonic. There's nothing evil going on here. You can see the fruits. You can see the fruits. Now the Bible says you can tell a false prophet, beware of false prophets, you can tell them by their fruit. It's simple. If you have the heart of a child, 
that childlike heart we're talking about. Oh, it is simple to identify the fruits. How, how, does, is love coming or is it judgment? I mean, look at the Pharisees. The way, if you were a follower, follower of the Pharisees at that time and you had a pure heart, you can see how they're demonizing this guy when you with a pure heart looked at Jesus and you saw nothing of what they're talking about. Even if they say, God told me, and there's some elite Pharisee, and they say, God told me this guy's doing some fishy business, but you go look for yourself, and you see nothing but fruits of love coming from Jesus? You, it doesn't matter how young or old in the Lord you are, you can identify that that Pharisee did not hear from God, but the angel of light. And you can see God moving there. This is what would have been happening in the times of Jesus. People could have made that choice. If they were too influenced by the Pharisees, they would accept that same spirit and be blinded to the obviousness of God moving in Jesus. But if they're uh, somebody who knows nothing about God or if they're a disciple who loves Jesus, they can see this is God. Look at the fruits, look at the love the Pharisees now made it their mission to kill Jesus. They wanted him killed. I mean, <laughs> and let's just like backtrack because if, let's, let's say you were a preacher in that day and somebody comes on the scene that's moving with the power of God. Do you think it's God's will to get that guy killed? Even if, even if there's some demonic things going on with that guy. Is it God's will for that guy to be, that preacher guy to be killed? No. <laughs> you know, Jesus, he, he, he never was like, Oh my gosh, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're deceiving all the people and there's so many people who are deceived and should be receiving from me and I got to come and I got to say, you're being deceived by the Pharisee. I got to shake them. You know, I got to go one by one. You're being deceived by the Pharisee. The, he's possessed with demons. You need to come over here. That's the dark side. Oh, like, do you see Jesus being full of like anxiety and forcefulness? No, you do not. You do not. Je you know, <laughs> the Bible says you need only to be still. God will fight your battles for you. Okay, so... In terms of the, the, the spiritual warfare coming against you or coming against people of God, it is not our job, job to go and shake somebody, convince somebody, there's demons there, there's evil there, ah, and force somebody. But it's our job to rest in the truth that God knows what's going on, that he's a God of justice, that he will fight our battles for us if we stay still, not if we get in the way, rather if we stay still. So if you want to go back, if we could preach this to the, the followers of the Pharisees, think about it. There was a lot of followers of the Pharisees and Sadducees at that time. If we could preach, go back in time and preach to them, this is what we would teach them. We would say, um, there might be a little red flag about your leader here, the Pharisees here, um, because if they're really with God, why are they, why don't they just do what God's called them to do and focus on the work of God that God's called them to do? Why are they trying to get this preacher Jesus guy killed? Right? I mean, God never forces himself on people, and he never wants us to force him on people or force truth on people or force what we think is truth on people. So if you were a follower of the Pharisee at that time, 
you could see this isn't the way of God to behaving this way and to be getting out of the way. If Jesus really was doing power by the work of Satan, like they were accusing him of, demonizing him, um, it wasn't their job to go get Jesus killed. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was not their job. It was their job to, if they, if they really carried the power of God, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they should let the fruits show themselves and allow those who will receive them come to them. That's what Jesus did. He didn't force himself on people, but he allowed those who would receive him to receive him. He didn't get bent out of shape and get so distracted by attacking Pharisees and Sadducees. No, he focused on the work of God that God called him to do. And he was available for those who would receive him. So then there comes a day where Jesus is put on trial. Um, and it says that it was the custom every year. This is Matthew 27, 15. Every year at Passover, it was the custom of the governor to pardon a prisoner and release him to the people, anyone they wanted. And at that time, Pilate was holding in custody a notorious criminal named Barabbas. So as the, crowds of no, as the crowds of people assembled outside of Pilate's residence, he went out and offered them a choice. He asked them, who would you want me to release to you today? Jesus, oh, Jesus who is called Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Anointed One. It says, now Pilate was fully aware that the religious leaders had handed Jesus over to him because of their bitter jealousy. Wow. Wow. So this reveals that it was known that the Pharisees were trying to attack this guy so much, demonizing them so much because they carried a spirit of jealousy of his power, of how people were led to him. Um, we're going to fast forward to verse 22 after he says, which one do, would you like me to release? Pilate says, uh, oh, they shouted. The people shouted. Wait, sorry. Verse 20. This is very important. Verse 20. The chief priests and the religious leaders were inciting the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be freed and to have Jesus killed. So Pilate asked them again, which of the two men would you like me to release for you, to you? And they shouted Barabbas. And Pilate says, what would you like me to do with Jesus? They say, crucify him. Pilate says, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting, crucify him. Now, now the religious leaders, it says, the chief priests and the religious leaders were inciting the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be freed. So the religion, even though the Bible says thou shall not kill at that time, before the new covenant came, even though, even though they knew that law, they were saying, everybody, demons are in Jesus, so we need to get him killed. We need to get him killed. He's going to lead people away from God, so you need to be killed. And so it's, it, it appeared to be like this righteous act, like God is here. Demons are, Jesus is operating by the power of Satan, so we have to do what God wants, which is get rid of him. Like that's how the chief priests and religious leaders were, were speaking. That's how they would have been speaking to the followers. Like this is what God's doing. So, wow. It wasn't just people who said crucify Jesus. By the way, this is a vote. This is a vote. The governor was asking, okay, I'm going to take a vote. Do you want Barabbas or Jesus to be freed or to be crucified? This was a vote. Okay. And so it was the religious people, the religious leaders, who convinced the people to kill Jesus. Wow. God was where Jesus was, but they just saw the devil. No real evidence, just theories 
that were planted by, planted in them by the, the Pharisees, by the religious leaders. This is very powerful because the spirits that were alive in that time were alive to, are alive today too. Jesus actually warns, warns us, Mark 8, 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread with them. And as they were sailing across the lake, Jesus repeatedly, repeatedly warned them, be on your guard against the yeast inside of the Pharisees. So he gives this warning, be on guard. And God is speaking this today. Be on guard. Be on guard because the Pharisee spirit is active and alive. You know, the devil hates the grace of Jesus. He hates for people to be free. And the way that he bounds people is by religion. Jesus came to break the curse of religion of the law. So it's the devil's scheme to try to get people to adapt the spirit of religion to this very day. We, I mean, just because Jesus was new on the scene and he had to deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, doesn't mean that it went away after that. We even see in uh, later on when, when the disciples are ministering in Acts, we see how Apostle Paul has to correct Apostle Peter because Apostle Peter was going back to his religious tendencies and he calls him out. He says, what are you doing? You're leading people astray with the spirit of religiousness that you're carrying. So the devil tries to creep in in that way and, and and that's the same spirit that demonizes the power of God. That's the same spirit that demonizes prophets of today, apostles of today. It's the same spirit that demonizes anointed vessels of God. It's the same spirit that says we can all, we don't need anybody else, you know, just all you need is God and demonizes when God moves or speaks through other people. It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit that in those days it said, that said, following the law is where God's at, not healing somebody. The Pharisees, that was their argument, is that Jesus was breaking the law. They thought and were telling to all of their followers God is absolutely here. I have it even in the Bible to prove to you. God isn't following the law. When in fact, God wasn't there in that moment, because there are parts of the law that's important. But in that moment, it didn't matter to take a break completely on the Sabbath. It, it mattered to heal the person, the sick person. Now, rest is still important. God gives us new revelation of what that means. But you see, when Jesus came, there's this revelation of grace that is so wide and deep. I'm telling you, it is, there's, it's so deep. The revelation of grace, it's so deep. And there's so many things that my eyes have been, personally, my eyes have been opened up to of how the grace of Jesus is so much deeper than I thought it was. Like, like the, 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 the fact that God can use somebody in their weakness that still, that still struggles with things, but, but God can anoint them with power and, and see them as beautiful and see them as okay. It's okay that they're not perfect yet. Like there's an example there. His grace is so deep. And so Jesus came with this new revelation of grace where he says, yeah, yeah, I know that the law says that, but now I'm going to breathe my spirit upon the Bible here. I came to set the captives free. I came to do my father's business. My father is saying, heal this person right now. I, I, I know it says rest, but I'm coming with a new revelation of what rest means. Resting doesn't have to be just a 24-hour day where you don't do anything, but resting is, is, is trusting me and, and, and not doing things by works and effort, but 
in everything that you do, resting, knowing that God is backing you up. It's his power in you, making all things possible. And it's not about your efforts. I'm coming with a new, I'm, I'm breathing my spirit upon the word. So the, the, the Bible we have today, there's so much of his spirit that's still yet to be breathed upon his word for many people. There's so many people who interpret these things are what's important to God more than these things. And that, and that's not the case. It comes with good intentions and, 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 and righteousness and pride creeps in where it's like, God definitely is here. God definitely wants this. And God's like, you, you need, you, you need more revel, new revelation. I'm over here, actually. I'm over, you, your intentions are fine and good, and, but, but I, I'm over here. I'm over here. The spirit, the Pharisee spirit, the religious spirit is, is at work large in the American church. It comes with that spirit that rejects the power of God and rejects miracles. The devil has a certain strategy over America to reject the power of God, to reject miracles, to demonize them. It's a specific spirit over America. It, 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 and I reveal this to you so you can be on guard, just like Jesus says in be on guard against the yeast inside of the Pharisees. You need to know that the Pharisee spirit is there, is, is out there, tempting. And in the time of Jesus, with the, the Pharisees, there was way more of them than Jesus and the 12 disciples. There was a much longer history of them as well. So just because you're hearing so many voices say God is here it does not necessarily mean that God is here. It's the same way that we see in the Bible with many are called few are chosen. Few are chosen to receive the deep mysteries of God. Few are chosen to really hear where God's moving. Many are called. God wants everyone to know where he's moving, but, but few become like a child. Few humble themselves. Few empty themselves out. Hallelujah. So, um, God wants to remind you that He never calls us to judge. He never calls us to demonize. It's not our job. Our main mission is to love others and to be an example of him. Be the light. Bring unity. Bring peace. Bring hope. Have faith that people would see you and say, ah, he or she trusts God. Wow, he or she has hope. Wow, he or she has light. They shouldn't look at you and see the Pharisee spirit. They shouldn't look at you and see, wow, that person has a lot of judgment. Wow, that person, they're so sure about something, but they're coming with, with, with judgment and they're so sure about it. I, I, this doesn't feel good. You know, even, even non-believers can recognize darkness. They, I don't want that. You see? So, you know, I, I, there's a lot of temptation right now in this, this week with the elections, the season, to demonize and to be distracted from what God's called you to do. It's, let's not miss this moment. The world, the country is full of anxiety. Let's not miss the moment to be a bright light for Jesus who carries hope and love and unity and compassion and understanding and generosity. 
and let the Lord fight your battles. Be still and let the Lord fight your battles. That's God's call for you right now. Be the light. Rest in Him. Love. This world, this country needs love. Jesus is true love. There's a lot of hate going on. Your main mission, show love. Be love. Love people. Love your enemies as the Bible says. That's your mission. Let God fight your battles. Don't judge. Don't hate. Love. Don't divide. Bring unity. That's what this country needs now. That's what this country needs. Jesus is the one who offers the supernatural power to bring peace, the supernatural power to bring unity, the supernatural power to love your enemies. Be the change that this nation needs. This is our harvest time. Let's, let's harvest the revival by being a light when it is dark out. Don't be distracted. Don't become part of the darkness like the Pharisees were, but be the light. God, I thank you so much, Father, for revealing your truth. I thank you for your precious word. I thank you for precious revelation, for your spirit that's alive and that reveals your heart that reveals where you are moving. God, I declare eyes to open up in Jesus' name. May the Pharisee spirit be revealed. May the religious spirit be revealed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. May there be unity. May there be unity in this nation. May the church be united. May the church not be distracted. I declare the spirit of religiousness to go in Jesus' name. I declare the spirit of Pharisee to go in Jesus' name. Spirit of judgment to go in Jesus' name. May wisdom come upon your people. Receive wisdom now in Jesus' name. Receive wisdom to discern where God's moving, to discern where God's speaking, to discern fruits. Receive strength and courage to go against the grain of Pharisees. To be the few, to be the few that are chosen. I declare wisdom to be poured out upon the body of Christ. For there to be a great awakening. Revelation. Of where God's moving. Revelation. Of where blindness was in the past. Eyes to open up in Jesus name. God, have your way in this nation. Let your will be done, God. May your justice come. May your peace come. May your peace come to every single person in this country, in Jesus' name. May your will be done, Lord. May your plans prevail. May your people get on board with your plans. May your people that are distracted by plans that are not your plans, that they think are your plans, may their eyes open up to where you are at in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen.